Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. For a few years either side of the millennium, the west and northwest of Ireland was treated to a short-lived invasion of giant bluefin tuna, the likes of which had not been seen in our corner of Europe since the British Tunny Club based at Scarborough to the 1950s finally folded due to lack of fish. Back then, it wasn't tuna numbers that were the problem. Rather, it was a moratorium on herring fishing, leaving anglers unable to locate these large predators which would feed around the herring drifters as they haul the nets. But sadly, this time around, dwindling numbers as well as pressure from various sources has pushed the species onto the International Council for Exploitation of the Seas, or ICs, endangered fish list. So, good while it lasted, but probably always doomed to collapse. Fortunate enough to have been there at the height of the run in 2004 was Bob Fitchy, who we're going to hear from now, with some recollections of a trip chasing giant bluefins off the Donegal coast. Indeed it is a fantastic recollection that I've still got a decade on. It's one of those things that you look back on and I kept all the records and all the photos and the articles and the website downloads that I did as part of the run-up to it. It was mainly really a 50th birthday folly, although because of Adrian Malloy's popularity we couldn't get in on that year. We had to wait till the year after. And it was inspired by an incredible photograph, still on, on the website, that was in, I think, Sea Angler. It was his catch in 2001 of a 968 pound bluefin tuna in Donegal Bay. The photograph is absolutely unbelievable. It's Unfortunately, the fish was taken. They don't do that, or they didn't do that as much then. It was very much tag and release when we went. But he stood against this fish and he just barely comes up to the bottom of the dorsal and anal fin, below what I'm reliably informed are the finlets, which are the little tiny sharp fins on the back of tuna and so on. But uh, an incredible photograph, and that's what inspired me to get something together. So we made contact, did quite a lot of planning. I got three mates to come across with me, and it just unfolded and happened and has remained in my memory for... uh, forever and a day since. It was a bit um, disconcerting, shall we say, in the run-up to the actual trip itself, because in the contacts I had with Adrian, which were telephone calls, didn't do emails then, uh, still particularly can't, I don't suppose, but uh, we wrote letters and so on. But um, when things like the accommodation fell through, I thought, oh, crikey, here we go. How, you know, what are we going to do now? And these guys are just so laid back, they're almost falling over. Nothing is an issue. Oh, I'll just ask another mate. Oh, we can do this. And we ended up in a beautiful house in Kilcar that was available, just through a a contact, through a friend, through a mate, whatever it was. And that was our base. A lovely little village, five pubs, a spa, and a Donegal tweed shop. So, you know, what more could we ask for? Two piers to fish from because uh, one of my mates was shore fishing with me whilst the other two were, were concentrating on the uh, the salmon fishing and so on. So we booked with the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. I don't think they run now from Liverpool. I had a lovely journey across, a lovely drive across, beautiful rolling countryside. Not fast on Irish roads at all, you don't do fast. And we duly arrived in Kilcar, we got to the house, there was a beautiful peat and wood fire roaring in the fireplace that uh, the owner had set for us and everything. And we settled in to the start of what was a fantastic few days fishing. We went on our first fishing trip to a pier. A very sm- When they say piers, it's not like North Pier at Blackpool or Bournemouth Pier or something like that. It's more like um, a small stone jetty forming a harbour. And Dave and I were fishing off there. And believe it or not, honestly, no word of a lie, first cast caught a fish. It was a beautiful pollock, lovely sort of red colouring to it, absolutely perfect condition. Unfortunately, it didn't quite span my hand. But there we are, it was a first fish on the first cast. As far as the shore fishing was concerned, we really should have taken advice and perhaps sought out some locals and got a guide 
to take us round because we didn't know. We got some information from the local tackle shop showing us the marks and things like that and we dug bait, that was okay. But to actually know where to go without inside knowledge is a bit difficult. We fished, it was beautiful just to actually be there, but with no great results, just a few bits and pieces. The lads managed to get a salmon off the river, which was quite a bonus. But um, we'd arranged to meet Adrian in one of the local pubs that happened to have a petrol pump, so it was a local garage as well. And um, he didn't turn up, so we arranged to meet him again, and he didn't turn up. And I thought, oh, what's going on here? We've, we've laid out nearly a grand for this charter, and we've got all this. And, and Anyway, it happened that the fishing action was at the top end of County Donegal, and he was up there with one of his fellow skippers. But uh, we did meet eventually and, and, and made arrangements to set off, and we were going to a place called Downings, which is right at the top end of County Donegal. So from where we were, Kilcar, as I say on the Irish roads, it was a very early start. I went with Adrian in his vehicle and the lads were in, in one of the cars that we took. And that in itself was an absolutely fascinating journey. We crossed all sorts of conversations from Irish history, the recent issues in Ireland, down to the biology of tuna and the tagging and, uh, and everything. It was a really, really good element to the trip. But we duly arrived at, this, uh, at Downings, at this little harbour, and that's where his boat had been moored because normally he would have fished a lot closer and off the shore in Kilcar, but the fish had moved further up, presumably with the Gulf Stream and so on, which is the bit that uh, entices them, and that's where he'd moored his boat rather than travel from his mooring up there, which would have taken quite a while. That's where he'd moored his boat. And there was another of his uh, colleagues, Michael McVeigh, who was actually up there as well. And he comes into the uh, the day of action a little bit later on. But he brought the boat, which I, I'm not sure how you say this, but it looks to me as if you say it like Naomi Carther was the boat. It was a beautiful boat, a lot bigger than I'd been uh, on at all. And um, it was obviously a very powerful boat and took us out. The sea conditions very changeable in Ireland as they are anyway but it didn't look too bad when we first got got on board but then when we got out of the shelter into the sea it was pretty bobbly shall we say three to four foot swell which might not sound very uh, dramatic but uh, it was quite something we set off went out a while and then started to get ready Adrian was very, very protective of all his, his gear, not only with the cost, the reels were priced at about a grand a piece apparently, but very, very precise in setting up and so on. I think we had four rigs out, two at the back, two at the sides, and the, um, the rigs that he put out were, I can best describe them as like stainless steel rods in the shape of a Christmas tree with the main lure at the end, the others were, I think they called them teasers, and they were like really big muppets, pinky muppets and everything that do a lot of splashing about and so on. And uh, the terminal, I don't think it was actually a Rapala. It was something like that, but it was something that Adrian had constructed and obviously mounted very, very carefully because, as he said, if you get into one of these, you want to be sure that you've got your best chance of keeping up with it and keeping connected. I'd actually bought, I'd tried to get a Rapala, one of the really big magnum mackerel patterned Rapalas. And I ended up sending to Bass Pro, I think it was, in Florida through a catalogue that a friend sent me across. And I, I sent for one of these massive Rapalas uh, and some other lures as well. And that duly came, no problem. But what came afterwards was a bit of a shock because I got a bill from HM Customs and so on for import duty. And that was almost the price of the Lewis that I'd bought. But anyway, that's, that, that's another tale. So the rigs were out, the, everything was going, we were trolling along. And then it was my turn to get trussed. And I really mean trussed up with a, a, a harness ready to be strapped into the dentist chair should anything happen. And it was then a matter of trolling up and down and keeping in touch with other boats in the area. 
It was we were going against the wave, so we were bouncing about. Not unlike the recent trip we had to Fleetwood when we were going across place fishing, and that was quite a swell. And Phil was in the cabin with the skipper, and the rest of us were outside getting sprayed to death and wet through, and thoroughly enjoying ourselves really. And it was a bit like that then. We were going along trolling and trolling, and we were under very strict instructions from Adrian to look out for birds. So we were doing our best, trying to keep our feet and everything like that. And all of a sudden there was a, a really big sort of bang and a, a, I don't know what else. And it, Adrian immediately shut the boat down and came out. And what had happened, we'd actually hit or got entangled in a, a piece of discarded troll net. The big blue nylon troll netting. And it had wrapped itself around one of the props and caused us to sort of, whatever the equivalent in marine terms, a stalling was. Absolutely distraught was Adrian, thinking not about the damage that could have been done, but <laughs> it was ruining what was happening. It obviously affected the performance and the noise from the props was quite something. So we had to get to, to try to get to grips with this, with uh, whatever it was that, that he had on board, and managed to free quite a lot of the, the stuff. It was a fair clump of nylon. I wish actually I'd have brought some of it back as a memento, really. It could have been a nice garden ornament and a tale to tell. But we managed to free quite a bit of it off. But I think there was still some that must have been wrapped round a little bit. And that affected the performance a little bit. But it was also giving off a bit more vibration and, and stuff. And, and that will come in to play as, as we started to, um, to get towards the fishing. So we set off again, trolling, 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 and the radio contacts and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, this colleague of, of Adrian's, Michael McVeigh, he was further up the course than he was, and he said that he'd had sightings of tuna breaking the water. So Adrian said, right, everything in. And he wouldn't let us bring the rigs in, wouldn't even let us bring the rigs in. He brought them all in. And then we set off, he just sort of kicked this... I don't know what it was, twin caterpillar something or other, into action. And we went really like a bat out of hell into these waves, heading towards what eventually was actually Malling Head. We're steaming away. We're still keeping in contact over the radio. Yeah, they're here. There's quite a lot. They're fishing, they're showing and stuff like that. So we said, right, right, keep out. Keep a lookout for these birds. You've got to keep a lookout for the birds, which we were trying to do. And a few minutes uh, into this, he, he said, there, there. And he's, he's like pointing at about 11 o'clock. And he said, there they are. Can you see them? Can you see them? And I looked and looked and I thought, I can't see anything. A minute or two later, he said, there. He said, can you not see them now? And I, I said, I'm really sorry. I can't know. I thought, he's taking the mick, this guy. There's no birds there. He's just building up this, uh, you know, the atmosphere on board and the excitement levels and stuff like that. Anyway, a couple of minutes later, he did say, he said, now can you see them? And lo and behold, these little tiny, tiny white specks became visible. And they were gannets, and they were diving at the scad and the mackerel and stuff like that. But what was the, the most exciting thing was, as well as the birds diving, there were little white splashes. And as we got closer and closer, the little white splashes became bigger and bigger. And then we started to sight these tuna these leaping leviathans, unbelievable. Trying to get photos of, just couldn't, they were that quick, you just couldn't capture one. But the photograph in my mind's eye, my memory, my little treasure chest of memories, was two tuna coming out against each other, shall we say, head to head. And as they turned and went into the water, they made a little tiny heart shape. And that was one of the little mementos that I'll never, ever, ever forget. But as we got closer to these fish, you began to see the size of them. They were like dolphins, same sort of size of dolphins, something like that. And when we really got close to them, as we did once, as they were going into the water and down, they were going with such speed, they were leaving like a blue vapour trail behind them with the bubbles and stuff like that, almost like the iridescent kingfisher back colour. Very, very, uh, oh, the power must have been incredible. I started to think, I don't know whether I want to get hold of one of these. What right have we for a start? And I thought, if I get strapped into that chair and I'm fighting one of these, Adrian reckoned they were between six and eight hundred pounds. 
So nothing really big, he said. We can, you know, there are fish there that are twice that size he's seen. And I thought, oh, I don't know what. Anyway, there was a pod of fish coming and the tactic was literally to head them off at the pass. We made a line that was going to bisect where these fish were coming and that would trail the, the muppets and the lures and everything in front of them. Get the ex- and and that w- that was the tactic, and as w- as we're coming along with this, and these fish are getting closer and closer, the four of us, fifty-year-old plus silly schoolboys, were s- well lapsing into Anglo-Saxon as we tend to do a little bit like, but squealing like silly school children. Oh dear, look at that one, sort of thing. And we were making such a noise, Adrian came out the wheelhouse and gave us a right dressing down to keep quiet. We'll be, we'll be frightening the fish off. But by this time, we were within, I don't know, 20 yards or something like that of these tuna, and they're coming out and disappearing down these blue vapour trails. Absolutely incredible. But, and the excuse that we had was that we thought that the fish were actually a little bit shy because of the strange vibrations that the prop was giving off with this bit of um, troll netting that must have been still attached to it and Adrian said that's probably just put them off a little bit and we didn't actually cross our paths and get the the lures right in front of the noses really but having said that we did see Michael McVeigh's boat uh, and somebody there was was hooked up to one of these leviathans and it, they, they actually did uh, did land that fish. It was the only fish landed that day. There was another boat that had one on, uh, unluckiest angler, had it on for an hour, and then it became detached, and that was his day. But at the end of the day, we'd seen sights we'll never forget. Somebody had the good luck to land one of these fish. One bloke was unlucky to have lost one. And when we arrived back in the port, we were absolutely exhausted. It was it, it just the adrenaline had been going for so long. It was incredible and without doubt the best fishing experience I've ever had, uh, certainly in my life. So that was my experience. I don't know that I'll repeat it. I don't think the tuna are there now. Certainly the websites are still available. You can go and research and see these photos and the reports from 2004, which is when when we actually went. So there's lots there. But if you wanted to go, you'd have to travel further afield, I I would think. But the big question left in my mind is what I do with this massive Rapala that I spent all this money on. And I'm I'm sort of um, half looking at Phil thinking, I wonder if it's Ferox bait. And I wonder whether that might be another challenge to add another species to my lifelong game Grand Slam. Before we close, there are a couple of points I would like to make myself regarding tuna. I've already done a full-length recording on the history of this short-lived deer with Michael McVeigh, who you've mentioned a couple of times in your piece, and he was saying that all the Irish tuna boats now have removed their outriggers and fighting chairs, though most haven't sold them yet, just in case. The other point I would like to make is that over the years in various corners of the world I've caught a lot of tuna myself, but always sadly at the smaller end of the size range. Well, I say sadly, but if I'm honest, and this is the point I'm trying to get at here, even at £20 or so a tuna will put up a tremendous arm-wrenching scrap, so maybe it's for the best that something upwards of £600 didn't latch onto your lure. Now that would be real self-inflicted punishment. The only tuna I've ever caught was a tiny, it must have been two or three pounds off Gozo. We were fishing for Lampuki, or the Dorado, in, in I don't know. Um, but in September, it's Lampuki season. Uh, and, and I caught this, this two or three pound tuna on a troll fly. And that went big style for me. Then the skipper of the boat was telling me off because I was trying to play this fish. And he'd say, no, get it out, get it out, you'll lose it, you'll lose it. And I thought, I can't. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying, but I, 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 can't, uh, I can't do a right lot with it. But it was tasty, it made a lovely fish stew with a lampuki and we got something like a bass. But well worth the money, I suppose, just to experience seeing them. Yes, it was, to see them, to be there, to experience them. If we'd have been on one of these photographic charters, Brian Rafferty went on one from Liverpool, looking for the birds and they were, they were catching mackerel, throwing mackerel and they got some incredible footage and stuff like that. I would have been happy 
just to have experienced the birds diving, the tuna so close, it wouldn't have been a, a lot of a loss to me not to have had a rod on board. Sounds stupid, really, doesn't it, when you're talking about a fishing uh, expedition, but I should have to think what these big, big fish look like. And pull-like. Pull, yeah, blimey O'Reilly. Yeah. They're just solid muscle, aren't they? I mean, the sickle-like fin and the torpedo shape of them. Just absolutely perfect design. And now, seemingly, they're all but gone. So a collection of memories to be treasured and probably not repeated, which in the case of the latter is something of a shame. Anyway, thanks for recounting the experience with us here. <laughs>